We are watching an extraordinary piece of history. This is the only known film to exist of Florham, while it was Hamilton and Florence Vanderbilt Twombly's country home for the spring and fall seasons. You will see tulips and daffodils in bloom, so we know this movie was made in the spring. This short home movie was shot in the spring of 1934 by Joseph Dunant, Mrs. Twombly's master French chef for 38 years. He must have had an assistant because we first see Dunant and his wife at the entrance gate to Florham. The section titles are in French, Dunant's first language. The gatehouse, seen briefly on the right, was designed by McKim Mead and White and completed in 1899 at a cost of $15,000. The camera follows the journey down the drive taken by all visitors entering the estate, this time at the walking pace of the Dunans. Monsieur Dunant was perhaps the most famous chef of the first half of the 20th century, as renowned as Julia Child was in the second half of the century. A profile in New Yorker magazine called him, quote, probably the richest and most famous private chef in the world, end quote. Chef Dunant knew that his mission was to fulfill Mrs. Twombly's sole request. He is quoted as saying, the only thing Mrs. Twombly asked for is that we give her the best of the best. Chef Dunant held an exalted rank among the staff at Florham and considered it beneath him to communicate directly with those who worked outside. When, for instance, he wanted fruit from the estate's gardens, rather than telling the head gardener, he called Mrs. Twombly's New York City office, which then instructed the head gardener what to bring Dunant and when he needed it. Quote, if I wanted something special or something changed, I would work through our office in New York and they would tell the gardener what to grow, end quote. Dunant had no budget and his expenses were never questioned. The passing train will stop at Convent Station, just a short distance from the estate. But the Twombleys had their own railroad siding located inside the brick wall along Madison Avenue. Here, their weekend guest arrived from New York City. In 1892, McKim, Mead, and White, the architects of the mansion, and Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect, urged on the Twombleys the construction of a bridge under the railroad so that the estate would have access to Madison Avenue. Hamilton Twombly balked over the price tag, $23,000. It was not until 1899, two years after the mansion was complete and the Twombleys began to stay at Florham, that the tunnel was finally constructed and the approach to the mansion from Madison Avenue, which we are following today, was in place. The close to 200 acres of the estate's living area grounds were initially designed in the 1890s by the renowned Olmsted, probably the nation's most prominent landscape architect at the time. He is best known for New York Central Park and was the landscape designer for other Vanderbilt estates, including Shelburne Farms and the Biltmore. After Olmsted had health problems and retired in 1895, the project was continued by Warren Manning, who worked for his own firm and Olmsted's son. It was Olmsted who convinced Hamilton Twombly to create Florham. To do so, the first step was assembling hundreds of workers to drain what had been a swamp and then create the contours of the grounds. Olmsted drew an elaborate plan for the planting and placement of trees, many of which were imported from throughout the world. As Olmsted told the Twombleys, quote, you have a sweep of landscape to an infinitely remote and prospectively obscure background, as much so as if you owned the state of New Jersey, end quote. And now we get our first glimpse of the mansion, which the Twombleys refer to as their country house and sometimes as the farm because of the many cultivated acres beyond the living area. The Twombleys retained the prominent architectural firm McKim, Mead and White to draw up plans for their country house estate, including the large farm. As William Mead explained to his partners, quote, Twombly wants a house on the order of an English country gentleman. I don't think he knows exactly what he means, and I'm sure I don't. But as near as I can gather, his idea is that it shall be a thoroughly comfortable house without the stiffness of the modern city house. Twombly is a sort of man who, if he gets what he wants, is willing to pay liberally for it, end quote. 
What the Twombleys wanted was this 110-room mansion, inspired by the wing, which William III added to Henry VIII's Hampton Court Palace as designed by Sir Christopher Wren. Note the entrance, a massive three-inch thick Honduran mahogany door to be opened and closed only by Frederick Burrell, the head butler, who looked like a distinguished diplomat. Note also the recumbent lions on either side of the front door, which now guard the home of Twombly's great-great-granddaughter in Portland, Oregon. This beautiful landscape featuring the fountain and gardens was, before the construction of the mansion, a swampy, overgrown tangle. Two years and over $100,000 were spent on the army of workers who drained the swamp and cleared the brush to create this lush setting. Many of these workers were retained after the completion of the mansion to manage the over 1,000 acres that constituted the Twombly's domain. These gardens, illuminated at night, were featured in the 2001 Academy Award-winning film A Beautiful Mind, and many wedding photographs have featured this setting. Arthur Harrington was lured from the British Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew to become Superintendent Gardener of Florham Gardens in 1896. He left at Hamilton Twombly's death in 1910 and later became well-known in horticultural circles. Beyond the gardens, and unseen in this film, was the thousand-acre Florham Farm. All of the vegetables, fruits, dairy products, and livestock the Twombleys used at Florham and at their summer home in Newport and their winter residence on Fifth Avenue were shipped to them each day from Florham by train as ordered by Chef Denon. These are Florham's Italian gardens, added 10 years after the estate opened. A local magazine on November 29, 1907 wrote, quote, Hamilton Twombly is having a fine Italian garden constructed to join his residence at Florham from plans by an English architect, Mr. Parsons. The work will approximate $50,000 in cost, and it is expected that the completed garden will be one of the finest in the country, end quote. There is the Orangery, where gardeners grew a variety of flowers and created new hybrids, such as the Florum lily. Behind it was the largest complex of greenhouses in New Jersey. What Denon calls the tennis court, because this building contained indoor tennis courts, is much better known as Miss Ruth's Playhouse, designed by the firm of Warren and Wetmore. Miss Ruth was Florence Twombly's daughter. The biggest party the family ever had was when they opened the playhouse in October 1924. As Chef Denon recalled it, quote, that party lasted for three days. I never forgot that time. We had 150 guests in the house for dinner, and for the dance, we had 600. I had to hire eight extra chefs for that weekend. On the day of the dinner and dance, I began at 6 o'clock in the morning and stayed until 4 o'clock the next morning. I almost fainted, end quote. <laughs> 
Anyone delivering goods would enter through a courtyard to the service entrance. The upper floors of this wing housed the servants' quarters. Florum needed a year-round staff of more than 100 to maintain the operation, even though the Twombly's were in residence only two seasons of the year. Here we see Mrs. Donon, proud of her automobile and driving off to be filmed. It's very unlikely that Mrs. Donon would have taken such liberties if Mrs. Twombly had been on the estate. Therefore, it seems likely that while the cat was away, the mice were playing, in this case, the Donons. This movie was made in late April of 1934. Anecdotal evidence helps us come up with that date. Mrs. Twombly's absence gave Mrs. Donat the opportunity to play Lady of the Manor, and that might also have been a reason this film was made. There is a wonderful story about Mrs. Twombly's trip to California for the wedding of her grandson, Shirley Burden, to a niece of the actor Douglas Fairbanks. This was 1934, the depths of the Depression, when details of the Lindbergh kidnapping filled the newspapers. Eighty-year-old Mrs. Twombly was concerned that her maroon Rolls-Royce driven by a chauffeur in maroon livery, might draw unwanted attention, leading to her kidnapping. She devised a strategy. She dressed as her maid and sat in the front seat of the rolls for the cross-country trip. Her personal maid dressed in Mrs. Twombly's clothes and jewels and sat in the back seat. There is no record as to what the maid may have thought about the possibility of taking the first hit for her employer. Florence Vanderbilt Twombly, the actual lady of the manor, set the pattern for Mrs. Denal's enthusiasm for Florum's flourishing gardens. A perfect orchid was placed before her at breakfast, another one at lunch, and another at dinner. With the orangery and the extensive complex of greenhouses and the cultivation of new hybrids, it certainly seems that Florence was into flowers as much as Hamilton was into the farm and especially to the prize Guernsey cattle. And note that the fountain garden in back and the Italian gardens were all laid out to be spectacular when viewed from her bedroom. The early photos of Florum reveal very stark, almost non-existent landscaping and gardens around the house. By the 1930s, when this film was taken, the gardens can be best described as lavish. All of this evidence seems to point in the direction of Florence's interest in plants and flowers, perhaps because she was born and raised on her father's farm on Staten Island. An example of a famous hybrid cultivated in the orangery, the Florum lily, was developed for Mrs. Twombly and registered under the name of Florum in 1899 by Arthur Harrington, the internationally recognized gardening expert. It soon became the nation's ancestor of numbers of lily varieties and, according to the description accompanying its registration, a spectacular addition to any garden. But the glorious flowers, gardens, shrubbery, and trees seen in the film by Mrs. Donat during her walk on a beautiful spring day were just part of the luxurious lifestyle enjoyed by Florence Twombly at Florham. <laughs> 
While she and Hamilton entertained frequently during their time as a couple on the estate, Florence spent an additional 43 years here after her husband's death in 1910. 56-year-old Mrs. Twombly and Miss Ruth, her 25-year-old unmarried daughter, continued on at Florham, far from the public eye. Their lives settled into a regular pattern, so set and formal that their staff knew just what they would be doing on any particular day of the year, years in advance, including their formal weekend house parties, five every spring, five every fall. Such was the magic of Florham itself, that if one couldn't have lived there as Mrs. Twomley or Miss Ruth, one may be justified in concluding that being a worker there was not a bad alternative. The 25 house servants and additional 100 members of the staff who maintained the grounds, greenhouses, farm, and the stables, who kept the estate running at a level of perfection, seemed to realize they were working at a special place. Employment records show that they stayed there for years, for decades, with periodic predictable raises. The men came to work wearing ties, which they kept on, even after pulling overalls over their clothes. Those working in the mansion had bedrooms with incomparable views. And, at mealtimes, they shared some of the bounty of the well-tended vegetable gardens, greenhouses, farm, and orangery. All seemed to take pride in maintaining and enhancing the beauty of the Florham estate. <laughs>